I'll control if you can hear me. I see the video playing. There's no sound coming out. Hi, sorry about that. We're going to restart the video since, yeah, it's supposed to have sound. Oh, 
Hi, everyone. Sorry about the technical difficulties, kind of, you know, technology, but um, like Francine and Selena said in the chat, this song is Rutoroar, which is translated to Our Elders by Eddie Enot, one of Marshall Island's legendary singers who has recently passed. And he was singing about remembering our elders and their experiences during World War II and the nuclear testing period. His music and legacy continues to be cherished, to, cherished today. Um, I also wanna give a thank you to Jonathan for opening up this program with the prayer. And before starting, similar to yesterday's opening, thank you to Selena for setting this up for us as I will be referencing from her. Um, we wanna give thanks to our Heavenly Father for bringing us together for this webinar, showcasing we are not alone with various nuclear frontline communities. We would also like to take this time to recognize and give respects to our nation's president, his honorable David Kabua, the cabinet, our Iroa Jimleiroa de Manet, Alabro, and people of the Marsh Islands. We also wanna acknowledge the people of this land that this webinar is being hosted from, Spokane, as well as the native lands that um, we're all calling in from. Additionally, to all nuclear frontline communities who continue to persevere and keep the torch lit. So thank you. Hello, everyone. My name is Jacqueline Lillette, calling in from Washington State as well. I'm an intern working with Washington Physicians and Social Responsibility and a part of the Speaker Outreach Committee with the National Nuclear Commission. Um, hello again. Good evening, morning, or afternoon, wherever you're tuning in. My name is Malika Andrique. I'm coming in live from Washington. And I am a research assistant for the National Nuclear Commission of the Marshall Islands. We are your MCs for today. Thank you for joining us. Um, to continue building family and relationships through this event, please feel free to use the chat and Jamboard to react, share your thoughts and feelings and connect with each other. Feel free to use the Zoom thumbs up and hearts to share love and share their stories into the chat. We will also have translation to Marshallese throughout the program today provided by David. Washington for Social Responsibility, Speaker Committee on National Nuclear Commission. researcher on Nuclear National Nuclear Commission on Mayal. So as of today, we will hear from a panel of community leaders who come from communities that have been directly impacted by the leg legacy of nuclear weapons. We will hear stories from atomic and cleanup veterans, downwinders, uranium mining communities, and understand our shared nuclear legacy after. Each speaker, David, will be translating each portion to Marshallese. And after we, if we have time, we will have a question and answer. So please feel free to put and any questions you have in the chat during the speaker's portion, and we'll address them at the end of the panel. Thank you. Thank <laughs> Bungalin Kamel Milo, a palm of our cheddar logic. And our Melole, Pavanado Vinar, Agair, Incova, Togan Pavanado Vinar. Elgino, the new work Kachita Muako, Jen Brain with Colonel Chodin and Rainin, Jenny Kadeke Chona Mero, Kova Pimichodin, and John Rubok, I am Chibang Chodin, Lochabro Kachita Muako, Langel and Kachita, Comaro Parano, the Rorilo, Chad Rumai, and Camelo Lebotet. 
So I'd like to begin the panel discussion by introducing our first speaker. Um, we will briefly introduce each speaker, but if you would also like to learn more about speakers for the event, please check out the speaker section on the event site. So to start off, Keith Kiefer is the national commander of the National Association of Atomic Veterans. NAAV advocates for atomic veterans and with the atoll radiological cleanup veterans, depleted uranium veterans, Fukushima veterans, and those potentially exposed to ionization radiation. Keith is an Anahuatl radiological cleanup veteran advocating for atomic veteran legislation on the state and federal levels. Welcome to our cleanup veteran brother, Keith Kiefer. National Association of Atomic Veterans. Rojan Enoda get all radiological cleanup veteran, depleted uranium veteran role, uh, Fukushima veteran, and Parano Chabrodro are chelidary kitchen ionizing radiation. Keith, a junior roar are terribly low in Enoda, and Enoda radiological cleanup veteran, and my Chibaran Katabara and atomic veteran, you know, chicken cooking one state, Parano de la Federal. George M. Carwanini, Keith Keeper. Uh, this floor is yours, brother Keith. Hello, um, can you hear me okay? Yes, okay. Yes, I have the honor of being the uh, National Commander for National Association of Atomic Veterans. Uh, it's the uh, acronym for it we call NAV. And uh, NAV has had the honor of uh, also partnering with the Marshallese on a number of uh, bills, um, as well as uh, working with other, other communities. Um, we helped uh, some of the Marshallese in Oregon with getting um, uh, permanent driver's licenses, uh, Medicare, Medicaid. Um, recently, we uh, worked uh, in with the uh, trying to get the uh, Medicaid for uh, um, the Marshallese as part of the uh, COFA package that uh, passed in December of 2020. Um, <clears throat> my connection to the uh, nuclear um, legacy was I was part of the second wave of the uh, Inuitak Atoll Radiological Cleanup Project. Um, when I first uh, arrived, uh, well, before arriving there, um, I had been told that uh, we would not uh, be seeing any radiation more than uh, you might see walking the streets of New York or uh, Colorado or wearing a watch with a radium dial. Um, I didn't have any um, um, pre uh, baseline tests uh, that you might expect somebody going into a uh, radiological cleanup uh, situation. Um, I was part of the first wave of, uh, excuse me, the uh, second wave of the cleanup veterans. The uh, operation took place between 1977 to 1980, and um, I was there in early 1978. Um, we worked uh, six days a, a week, 12 hours a day, um, in terms of uh, trying to uh, reclimate the islands and uh, make it safe for the islanders to return. Um, that included scraping anywhere from six to 18 inches of soil and uh, transporting it over to uh, Rowan Island and deposit in cactus, uh, cactus crater. Um, my first uh, uh, impressions of uh, Inuitak Atoll was, uh, um, I thought it had very beautiful beaches. Um, the uh, um, water was a beautiful uh, blue, uh, uh, blue green. Um, it had some incredibly uh, attractive uh, fish, and um, 
Um, also, I, um, I enjoyed uh, collecting seashells while uh, being there. Um, it, uh, in some ways, also reminded me of Alaska in that uh, there was a girl behind every tree. The problem was uh, there wasn't any trees uh, or the vegetation was very minimal. Um, the, uh, uh, I was surprised to still, still see um, a number of remnants from uh, World War II uh, ships that had been sunk, uh, um, uh, various uh, um, army um, uh, trucks and, and uh, tanks. And uh, often we'd come, up, uh, come upon uh, a, a unspent ammunition uh, that was uh, still uh, still there. Um, I, I some of the uh, leisurely activities was I enjoyed uh, uh, snorkeling and and sailing while while was there while I was there. There was very little time for doing that. Um, I wound up uh, having an opportunity to get on, I believe, every island except Japtan when I was there. Japtan was off limits because uh, there was a Marshallese uh, uh, group there, and I believe they didn't want the uh, service members fraternizing uh, or mixing with the uh, Marshallese uh, individuals. Um, I did occasionally see the Marshallese uh, um, ship come uh, come in. And uh, they would uh, some, sometimes come and uh, shop at the uh, BX uh, there on um, the main, main island of, of Inuitok. Um, we wound up uh, for our drinking water. It was uh, 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 water that was taken out of the lagoon and uh, desalinated. Um, uh, and uh, we since have learned that the uh, snorkel for both the water on the main island as well as uh, uh, Lojwa was uh, very close proximity to uh, um, some of the dump sites that, where they dumped uh, uh, radioactive material. Um, <clears throat> I uh, um, had no clue that our uh, operation of cleaning up uh, or uh, reclaiming the islands was a failure until March of uh, 1980, when I saw a 60 minutes uh, um, video uh, called Remember uh, in a We Talk. And that's when I uh, uh, wound up uh, learning that our, our mission uh, to clean up the islands had, had been a failure. Um, I can, even though I have a number of health issues, I consider myself to be um, fortunate um, uh, in comparison to many of my other uh, fellow uh, uh, veterans and civilians. Uh, many of them have gone on to contract cancer and, and a large number of them are no longer with uh, us. The uh, first indication I had that uh, my experience at Inuitok um, was, uh, uh, had a detrimental effect on my health was uh, when my wife, uh, even though we uh, weren't using any uh, um, birth control, uh, my wife wasn't getting pregnant. That's when I learned that uh, I was technically sterile. Um, uh, I went on to have a number of uh, health issues, uh, deep bone pain, uh, muscle, muscle pain, uh, fevers that would come and go without any um, explanation. The doctors couldn't uh, give me any answers to that. Um, um, I've developed uh, um, autoimmune diseases. Uh, I have a thyroid problem. I have a blood clotting uh, disorder um, uh, and uh, also uh, peripheral neuropathy. Um, I have a number of uh, skeletal uh, issues also that uh, uh, have the potential of being late linked to uh, radiation exposure. Um, the uh, protection that the uh, uh, individuals there had uh, varied, but it was uh, very minimal if, if 
if any. Um, the entire time I was there, I never had a uh, uh, radiation badge, um, uh, even though I was uh, uh, on, on all the islands, uh, with the exception of JAP-10. Um, I didn't have a uh, mask, um, um, no, uh, um, uh, there was never any um, urinalysis test uh, uh, that they uh, performed on on myself. Some of the some of the individuals did have um, film badges. Some of the individuals did have uh, uh, urinalysis tests or baseline tests uh, taken on it. Um, the uh, um, uh, <clears throat> so far this year, um, uh, we're off to a good start in terms of uh, uh, trying to uh, help out many of the individuals that uh, have suffered uh, from this uh, particular uh, um, cleanup operation. Uh, we're also working with the uh, uh, cleanup veterans that were involved with Palomar, um, uh, Rika, um, also getting recognition for many of the veterans, um, extending Rika, uh, we've been working with uh, some of the downwinders and, and other, uh, other organizations. Um, uh, I've kind of had a loss of other, other things to tell you, uh, tell you about it. Uh, it's, uh, it's, it's a real shame that what, what has happened to, the, to those islands. Uh, it's, it it uh, um, could have been a very picturesque, in many ways it still is a very picturesque uh, uh, area, but uh, um, it also uh, um, has uh, been scarred by the uh, many activities that the United States and, and other organizations uh, um, conducted on the islands. So um, I thank you for the opportunity to uh, share a little bit of my story and, and a little bit about NAV. And uh, uh, at the end here would be welcome to uh, answer any questions uh, anyone might have. Thank you. Thank you, Keith, for sharing. Um, our Thank you. And then one more welcome to Google Chitigano, Camino Lego and Keith. Uh, and I'll join AOH Chief Commander and National Association of Tommy Veteran, M. Jarbaleo on H. Join OH, Luridage, Jaramanova, Chibango, Rigido, and Oliver Tommy Veteran and Clean Up Veteran Room, Rar Jarbalido and Wodak. The Going Keith, Join our Perion and Wodak, the Lotharian Clean Up Project, Kaban Jim Jong Jimion and Rally the Wool, a much clear lock, you know, Island Guar, a Elevator, Menor Roman, a Louis, Chinon and Gardalan Island Guar. Hello, I put you on. That's our book chair. When you talk about that book two carun, Melo Lego Rala Dum Ramanar book two can you just look at it? Ah, that's Melo. Ah, can you know that all when three in the period of that, ah, Elugun Labanagar, Toglimon, Kalupuke, can Toglupuke Hello Island go out. Arparanot, Cholagien, can you know that Manmanien can Kalimon can you know that and ah, Angwar. Em Barano Charval in Chejarger Hilo Malon Island Goa. Et Bagilo Tere Arperio and Noda, Echolok Armenian Majara Yone, Arperio Alban Enego, Rodrigo Yon and Noda, Gilagano Chevadan, Garbor John Kagene, Cholok Armija Jalan Chevadan, Begaro Armenian Majalijo, Em Melolin Bertarinaro, Chenaro, Dalan Chevadan, Begora Romajal Retterio. Arbaranot Ion Elenka in Nan Mijuko, Elegant Tregain, Matan Katabarwan Rulinan, National Association of Tavan Veteranage, Bigot Yalan Chibankain, Empe Ren Kilir, Kino Air in Kilir, Majloe Elen Yan Member Ruan, Rora Perilo Ilemo, Lavlak Choran or Chenevir, Chilagano de Chicho, Nan Mijuko Gioni, and Okainan Majano Majalayo and Punin Rajatali Madak. You and Elenka in Pivago, Miraja Lemdo, I shall own in Camilo Legir, you and Baranot, Matacuan, Rigo, Rin, Tonian, Wawan Gorala, Walongane, Yum Karaipen, Elegant Yerin, Rillum, 
loge chemeron gar lemnejin polen ne jalamla alben wa wayne gain rajido ko chen cherbalin ke melmel borar walo le majal em ko nge arterion majalam ka chom kar eri nen wada ilo tere gain paga gi em kirej kalwan mononen ka molol we emeron ko badok rolilina ne chibang elon ro me rej wada gir atami pedaran em clean up pedaran ro em baranot rom ra chelbe ra ba town winter e chen cherbalin ka melmel gain ilo pa Again, thank you, Keith, for sharing your experience. A uh, second, we have our second guest speaker, Tina Cordova, is a seventh generation native New Mexican born and raised in the small town of. Tula Rosa in South Central New Mexico. In 2005, Tina co-founded the Tula Rosa Basin Downwinders Consortium with the late Fred Tyler. The mission of the TBDC is to bring attention to the negative health effects suffered by the unknowing, unwilling, uncompensated, innocent victims of the first nuclear blast on earth that took place at the Trinity site in South Central New Mexico. Good evening, everyone from beautiful Albuquerque, New Mexico, where we had snow this morning and it's 60 degrees now. Happy St. Patrick's Day. I want to thank the Washington Marshallese community for hosting this event and for asking me to speak. It's always an honor for me to be able to tell the history, the forgotten history, the untold history of the New Mexico downwinders. And I'm particularly proud tonight to serve on this panel with these other very distinguished uh, panelists who have suffered greatly as a result of the nuclear development and testing that has taken place in our country through, throughout the years. Uh, as was mentioned, my name is Tina Cordova. I'm the co-founder of the Tularosa Basin Downwinders Consortium. And uh, I want to focus on uh, basically just a few things tonight. I first want to talk to you all about the test itself that took place at the Trinity site and why uh, the uniqueness of the test made it so damaging to our health. I want to talk about the lifestyles of the people in New Mexico in 1945 and how that also maximally exposed us to radiation. And then I want to talk to you about my family story and how we're fighting so hard to get the Radiation Exposure Compensation Act extended to cover the people of New Mexico um, because we were the first people exposed to radiation any place in the world, and we've basic, basically been forgotten. And part of that is the fact that the government has controlled the messaging from the very beginning and throughout time. Uh, they said then, and they continue to say today, that the area around the Trinity site was remote and uninhabited, but we know as a fact that there were tens of thousands of people, men, women, and children, living within a 50 mile radius to the test site. And if you extend the radius to 150 miles, it encompasses some very large cities like Albuquerque to the north, El Paso to the south. And now we're talking about hundreds of thousands of people. So let me focus on the test itself. The Trinity test had to take place on July 16th, 1945. And the very sad thing about that is that it's our rainy season here in New Mexico. We live in the desert and it's very dry. But in the month of July and August, we receive a great deal of our annual moisture. And so we get these very strong thunderstorms that come in and they actually uh, produce a lot of wind and some very violent storms at times. And on July 16th, uh, the test was supposed to take place in the middle of the night, but actually it was postponed until about 5.30 in the morning when there was a break in the weather. And the physicists that, I mean, the meteorologists and the physicians that were assigned to the test to look out for human health had already warned that conducting the test under these conditions, these conditions of these major um, wind storms associated with these thunder and lightning storms was gonna produce fallout that would, would be taken to all these little communities that surrounded the Trinity test site. I think it's important to note that we have identified ranching families that lived as close as 12 miles to the test site. And that's important because exposure to radiation is a, 
uh, a matter of distance and time. So the closer you live to the test site or the nuclear disaster, um, as it has been termed as of recently, uh, the closer you live to the test site, the more exposure re you receive. So there was a break in the weather. They placed this bomb on a platform 100 feet off the ground. That was never to be repeated because what happens is the force of the blast came down, it intercepted the earth, it took up an enormous amount of dirt, sand, animal and plant life, incinerated it because it produced more heat and more light than the sun. And it took a fireball that went over seven miles into the sky, past the atmosphere into the stratosphere. For days afterwards, a white ash settled out on everything, on every living thing, on all the, the earth, and it got into our water systems. We didn't have running water back then, so we depended on cisterns to collect water. And during the rainy season, people's cisterns would have been filling up. And, and that is when people would have been collecting the most water into these cisterns. And now the water was com completely and totally contaminated. The other thing about the Trinity site that was unique is that because the bomb had to detonate that morning, they overpacked it with plutonium. There was a full 13 pounds of plutonium placed in the bomb, but only three pounds were necessary for the fission process. So a full, pounds of, uh, a full 10 pounds of radioactive plutonium with a half-life of 24,000 years went up in that fireball and then was dispersed all over the entire state of New Mexico. Now it was a part of our water system, as I has, have mentioned before. If you don't have running water, and everyone knows that the three methods for being exposed to radiation are inhalation, which we were doing because of the ash that was falling from the sky, absorption through your skin. If you don't have running water, you don't bathe as often. So whatever you got on your skin and in your hair and on your scalp that day probably remained there for many days until you were able to bathe. And now it's in our, our water our water that we use for drinking and cooking. Um, the other thing about 1945 in New Mexico is that we didn't have refrigeration. There were no grocery stores. We couldn't go to a store and buy dairy or meat or produce. We had uh, mercantile stores that sold things like flour, sugar, rice, coffee, cereal, but nothing that was refrigerated, which meant that every single thing that we consumed, we produced ourselves. So we had gardens and orchards. And I always remember that as a child, we would literally go from one person's home to the other and sit in the fruit trees during the summer. And this was the summer when it would have been the height of the production of fruit and vegetables that women would have been canning and drying for the winter months. And we would sit in the fruit trees and we had fruit trees of all types. We had nuts, you know, we had pecans, we had walnuts, um, we had apricots and peaches and apples and, and cherries and dates and, you know, figs, every type of fruit, and our mothers and our grandmothers would have been drying and canning all of that for the upcoming winter. And then we had milk cows, and there were active dairies in all the little towns. In the little town I grew up in, there were three active dairies, even when I was a child. And so, you know, we, we were producing our own milk, and people had goats and, and, and cows for the production of milk. We had chickens that we utilized for a source of meat and protein and then eggs. And um, what we couldn't produce that way, we also hunted and we still hunt to, to today. And we supplemented our food source with small mammals like rabbits and birds like quail and doves. And so everything was destroyed and we were maximally exposing ourselves. Now, before the test was conducted, General Groves, who was the head of the Manhattan Project was told that he should make plans for an evacuation. And they did make plans. But when they met the threshold for evacuating people, they decided to wait until that threshold doubled. And it doubled. And then when they met that threshold, they waited until it actually went to four times the level they had originally set. And then at that point, they just told the monitors to leave because they knew the exposures were so high. So those soldiers that were placed in those towns around there all left and they, they, they stopped monitoring what was happening with the radiation. In my own family, I'm a cancer survivor. Uh, I'm the fourth generation in my family to have cancer since 1945. Uh, two of my great grandfathers developed what they called uh, digestive or stomach cancer at a time when no one had ever heard the word cancer in my little village. And they both landed up dying a horrible death because in 1955, there was very little available, especially in small rural parts of New Mexico to treat people that had cancer. They suffered greatly before they died. 
my two grandmothers had cancer, although that's not what they died from. And then my beloved father, who I miss every day of my life and who died in March of 2013, developed oral cancers um, and the process for treating those was horrific. He didn't have any viruses, he didn't smoke, he didn't drink, he didn't use chewing tobacco, but he was a child, a small child growing up in a downwind community when they detonated the bomb after at, at Trinity. And he drank massive amounts of, of fresh milk every day. My grandmother used to say, your, your dad didn't drink glasses of milk, he drank gallons of milk. And I have been told by health physicists that the radiation settled in the glands of his neck and his throat and very likely caused the horrific cancers that he developed. Uh, two of them distinctly different where they had to remove parts of his tongue. Uh, my dad lost the ability to speak at the end of his life, swallow, and for months and months, nothing passed through his mouth. Um, he had to have a feeding tube two different times. I had thyroid cancer and the first thing they asked me when they diagnosed me was, when were you exposed to radiation? Did you work in a lab? Did you have a lot of uh, x-rays as a child? And I said, no, but I grew up in a community 40 miles away the crows fly from the first nuclear test site and they never came back. They have never been back. They have never checked on us. And we found out in 2019 when there was a, a paper published by uh, Tucker and Alvarez uh, that the infant mortality in New Mexico spiked in the months after Trinity. After a 10 year decline in infant mortality in New Mexico, all of a sudden our infant mortality went from something like 30 deaths per thousand to over a hundred deaths per thousand. We had casualties of the Trinity test and they were our babies. And it's not, it's not hard to imagine why when you're so overexposed to radiation as a child, when your body mass is so small, it can't take the radiation load that you're exposed to. And then the poor mothers that had infants at that time were concentrating the radioactive iodine in their mammary glands and then breastfeeding their babies and they were overloading their babies with radiation. And every time I think about it, it's, it's unconscionable because when health workers contacted the US government and said, our babies are dying, they are dying of something that looks a lot like dysentery, they have profuse diarrhea and we can't stop it. The government decided to deny that there was anything they could think of that could be causing this, but we know, we know now. And so for us, this is, this is my life's work. Uh, the TBDC is an organization with a steering committee. We spend enormous amounts of time strategizing how to get the government to recognize what they've done to us and to come back and take care of us. I'm just gonna say this much. There is a moral and an ethical imperative to right a wrong. When you know something is wrong, when you know people have been damaged, when you know people have suffered an injustice like this and you say nothing or do nothing, you are complacent and you become complicit in the problem. And so my, my goal today is to say to the Marshallese people, you are not alone. Lots of people have suffered this fate we have to stand together and we have to stand strong and we have to make sure that our voices are heard and they never look away from us again. They have to look us in the eye now and they have to pass the amendments to the Radiation Exposure Compensation Act to come back and take care of us because this is not gonna end. When we know that a radioactive isotope with a half-life of 24,000 year, years has been spread all across the desert in New Mexico, we know this is not gonna go away anytime soon. And so I'm gonna ask you all, please, please go to our website. It's trinitydownwinders.com, www.trinitydownwinders.com. I'll put it in the chat. Please go to our website to learn more about our work. And again, I appreciate so much the opportunity to participate tonight. I'm supporting right now my aunt, my 81 year old aunt. She, she is coming to Albuquerque. She is staying with me so that she can get treatment now for breast cancer, my dad's older sister. This doesn't end, ladies and gentlemen, there's no end to this for us. Thank you so much. Thank you. Um, we're glad that you were able to take the time out of your day to share your life experience with us. And we're just very grateful that you're here with us and hope all is well on your side.
kamolol mota rugu MC Rainer perjuangan yang armijar kalau kain kain kian kan rom bet rom jaga kain kian just a quick summary again just summary but Tina thank you very much just want to mention that real quick um Tina join yang rom bet nado ko ibu bini kain kajil mijon a native New Mexico rom a lot of ilo Atalorza, I tell you, South Central in New Mexico. The Rodo and Lamino Tina, Tino Yon Rulu Nathan, Atalorza, Payson, Downwinters, a consortium, a TDBC, a DC, MH, Yagan, Emotogman, Fred Taylor, M. Catabarum Gloriaga and Rulin, a TBDC, Aging and Bodok, then attention and Bodok, Malayan Home, Lamanaco, Hichen, Wawinan. Joran, lagi jemur orang army room bar, Ion, kami lebih nampu ilogar South Central New Mexico, Northern Trinity side, izin pagar. Emi lo kena nongai nang kerain Tina perjuangan lain nak kamu lo lekan nang jual lagi nampu. Jatuh pun ada nongai, punya merong kalau malah jangan kagim nang lekan pun ada nongai nang rumah itu. Ia muda tak kamu lo Washington Marshall izin kan air kau mana ini, punya merong kau bawa tu pendron ini ilo izin. Tolores Central South Mexico, yo chino da da mar work kami milen pam. Ilo Trinity side yo ecepat tolak jen, ijo me rutoro an rar rutolak ye eju to jen ipi bino air. Ar kaman ilo chula jo chino chonda jen dalam yur pugu yang kalem. Ilo chin eneh cemaran jo chikin yo melukun pan marai. Ame ecepat kudu kuda nuot. Ilo terin me rar kaman ekam me gain. Eka kano yo lab. I know Kodo, Ladwood, Rome Red Pogeron, Lale Melodo, El Tata Lale, Muran Army Lotterain, Mary Comanacan Milligan, Tarajan, Rain Maratan Comanacan Milligan, Rangabon Malo, Pekio Elbun, Ebungodo, Melabun, Elabkodo and Terrain, Rajalaga and Garbulin Chilad Army Rotor. But after our mouth, Comanacan Milligan, Luchimarcon Rano, Chongoro, Mile, Tola, and Jomera Comanacan Milligan, Ejijom, Army Rolling Rarteri, Lot Trinity. Em, pahamin ar jangan lebih ngar pokok lagi kami memilih itu teriak. Walau ngelok, rujuk ini macam lalai ini pernah nampak percaya lagi atau kumcilat. Alam beru ilo, ilo teri ini lo nubeh juga. Alvin mengaku kejir, Alvin minin mau urwayat, Alvin wayan air mau lo teri ini. Kelina air mau raya no cah, rojat teri lo cikin gaya ni. Terbaru dia ni minin mau urwo. Em, dalam pahu ni jir, em rojat terbaru itu rojat kajari ni kaki rane jilat itu lip pernah nampak mengai. Kau tu, mereka jadi tu milik orang mereka umur, tar kanoi corai, jenol pun kami milik. Malah bukan ini perangan pokok naik ramen atau boleh dengan kami cibang ron, lada tahun malam korang orang kajar balik. Eh, mereka arpa keron Manhattan Project, jenol cross, arwar, jenol air kalmala jenol kan, wah wah ini kamera dah ramai jalan ini wala corai. Pada tar jem maga jem kamera dah ramai rorar, tapi jodoh jo, kat terot mai ini lugu tu lagi. Trina, Trina di kalau kejir, again jenuh jenuh kini kajim jauh jen pamele orang jenuh dah dah merat pelu terin kami milik kini, emas itu ane nangan milik kini terlak, jauh roh cuma nalar tar cakoi jen cancer, milik kuna nana cakoi rilo, contoh jen dah milik kini mau lalai mau, ecjalo kat teri dengan cancer rilo, juga ini kanan orang kini jauh nampak sekolah, jauh roh cuma nalar paling nampak cancer arah celah ter, emas itu milik kuna awak ya alat ada ecjemen, emar cakoi lo maju lo roh dah jen cungu cili yo. Ar parano low cancer, mengapa cip cuan ini Iraq, kerana kerja kerja cip cuan ini kebala, agar yon cancer. Adalam cip merong kor kanono, ar kemana alat turut dengan, wawanan merong cip ang kanono, jomlah kalau meruan ar cago agar cip merong kena dengan ciri, kena cerai ni. Emi, apa kerja mandak dengan kia bagi lor roda ini cung dalam jono, agar war cuan kemana le. Eh kalau ke ilo izin mereka akan mana kami milih. Moga dah agar cilungul madan paling cuan dah jenar mizan cawan jenar mizan rawa balik pun ada le. Ebagai nangin cuan dah izin agak cukup madan cuan dah jenar mizan cawan jen kami milih lagi. Cuan wanjang akan cawan lagi mereka kacung noi. Jep kalau kar kari kerang jenar mizan mkr kacung dulu jaga tu kau tuan malu ko anir. Ilgun milih nauruk kaya neu. Yang pegeron, pegeron kaki ini, rane pejeh pilih ni mana mana mereka jenah dan riga, dan cipang rollu lain air kebar mirai air itu terain. 
Menolvan, Kamolaga, Portun Alan Jotin, Telegram, Kanonogale, Nailing to one men, Ganan Column and Pinjillo Chosen, Pelangi Luchun, Wanjo, Chun, Charvala Major Mole, Chalok Moli, and not Kamen Milgain, Emeagar, Charvalin Nojagar, Noji and Armiro, M. Chichep Kamani Yokonar, Indem Chichen or Rome Rad Noji, which is Pokona, Laguna or Payan Pokona, Mipara Yankajang and Ulan Madonna and Chodi, Chichep Magaya, and Kajan Romajero. And then come over with the company in the Vinco Badum Pendron, and Chair of Pavanato Once again, Tina Comova, Pastor MC. Thank you, Pastor Tina Comova. 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 Thank you, Pastor Tina communities in northwestern New Mexico. Jonathan is also a member of Eastern Navajo Dine Against Uranium Mining, ENDA-UM. He helps work on issues related to past uranium mining activities, addressing contamination near Navajo communities and preventing new uranium mining projects. My name is Jonathan Perry, and I'm from uh, northwestern New Mexico. I'm a member of the Navajo Nation. I am uh, also the uh, president for my community. The Navajo Nation made up of 110 uh, communities, and we lack local leadership. So I was uh, given that responsibility by my community. And uh, for nearly a decade, I've been active with the Eastern Navajo against uranium mining. And uh, I'm sorry, I got, uh, can you hear me? Um, it's a little choppy. I think we don't have a great connection. Maybe try speaking again. Uh, can you hear me now? That sounds better, yeah. Okay, <laughs> well, hopefully. Uh, yeah, the infrastructure on Navajo Nation isn't too great. Um, but uh, yeah, I'm, I'm coming here from uh, Crown Point, which is north of uh, I-40, northwest Albuquerque. Well, I'm part of the Eastern Appalachian Agriculture and Mining Organization. With Um, Jonathan, if you're still there, I think we've lost you again. The connection still doesn't sound very good. Yeah, someone in the chat had a good suggestion. Um, I'm not sure if you're calling in or um, joining, but maybe calling in would help. Okay. Yeah, we, we could try that. Have you call in um, and see if we can have hear you that way. Sorry, everyone, I apologize for technical difficulties that we have. Uh, Jonathan, if it's convenient for you, if you want us to come back to you when you're able to um, 
call back in and then move on so we can move on to the next speaker if that's okay with you if that works for you to figure out okay um we'll let jonathan know as he's calling in but for now our next speaker is robert celestial a retired U.S. Army Sergeant. He is Guam Area Commander for the National Association of Atomic Veterans and the President of the Pacific Association Radiation Survivors. Welcome, Robert. Thank you very much. Yes, half a day, good morning uh, to everyone. I wanna thank uh, Lily and Holly and all the uh, Marshallese people. I wanna, I really appreciate uh, Keith and Tina and uh, it uh, hopefully we'll get Jonathan back on. Can it, I hope everybody can hear me. Can you hear me, Jacqueline? Yes, we're gonna start a PowerPoint. We have a PowerPoint presentation and uh, I'd like to also thank uh, Rosario Parrish. She's our secretary and she's also a social worker here in Guam with a master's degree and she's the one that's doing the, the slides. And uh, I'll explain how and why Guam, the resident of Guam should be included in RECA, which is the Radiation Exposure Compensation Act. Uh, the facts and documents were kept secret until 1994. Uh, my island was on a security clearance access from 1946 to 1962, and anyone who wanted to visit our island uh, needed a security clearance to either come in or leave. And so um, this is our group, our first group, and the majority of our first group uh, have passed away. I'll go ahead, next slide. And this is our group in 2018, and uh, we are continuing to uh, uh, advocate and, and uh, and hopefully get Guam into the Radiation Exposure Compensation Act. Next slide. And almost every year we've had a, a, our annual general membership meeting. And since uh, SARS, uh, COVID-19 hit, we weren't able to uh, get a 2021 or 2020 uh, general election. So uh, next slide, Rosario. And these are the gentlemen that helped us from 2001 all the way up to today. And uh, they were our late speaker on PINCO, our Senator Santos, Ben Pangolinan, our late speaker, and Dr. Chris Paris, and our health physicist that helped me, uh, Mr. William Brady, and a scientist from England, Mark Perday, and also Lieutenant Bert Schreiber, and the late Ed Beneventi. And all of them has passed away since we uh, advocated uh, since 2001. Next. So our island was a close island from 1946 to 62, as I mentioned earlier. And this is a destination uh, from the United States. They detonated 66 nuclear hydrogen bombs in the Marshall Islands with 43 detonations at Inuitaka Atoll. Next. And oh, next slide, I'll say, there you go. And I wanted to show you the atoll, Inuitaka Atoll. There's a, the main island, Inuitaka, Rundit Island, and Lojua. Next slide, please. And Guam is approximately 1,200 miles uh, west from Inuitaka and the wind currents and water currents flow directly on the westward uh, direction. Next, please. And so I just wanted to show the radius from Bikini Island on the destination uh, from uh, uh, the Bravo site because the Mike Ivy site was uh, detonated on Inuitaka. Next slide, please. Next. And just to show you enough, okay, good. So after I left the Board of Radiation Effects Research Committee in 2004, I visited Lieutenant Bert Schreiber and he was a Navy officer here in Guam. He was a radiological, biological, and chemical officer stationed on Guam in November 3rd, 1952. Uh, his, in his sworn statement, he stated that the Geiger counters were going off the scale in 1952. Next, please. Just wanted to show you the longitude and latitude. Uh, it's not a very good picture, but I just want to give you an idea for wind direction. Next, I want to show you the precipitation uh, from the wind currents. Next, please. Yeah. Precipitation with wind currents, water currents. This is where Hawaii is in Guam. And, and after 66 nuclear detonations, uh, it was uh, uh, found that uh, we were inundated with uh, nuclear fallout and uh, uh, 
radiation from the water currents. Next, please. The Radiation Exposure Compensation Act was enacted in 1990 with compassion and payments. Next. Next. Yes, and uh, President Bush at that time in 1990 signed into law uh, H.R. 2272, uh, the Radiation Exposure Compensation Act. And it's very important that down here it says the bill provides compassion payments to persons with specific uh, specified diseases who fear that their health was harmed because of fallout from atmospheric atomic testing at the Nevada test site. And this is very important because he said, regardless of whether causation can be scientifically established, and, and that's very important, and that's the intent of the law, and that's why he signed it. And so, Nick? Next, next, please. Just wanted to show that he, he was the president at that time. 15, 1990. Next, please. So, in four years later, uh, Secretary of Energy Hazel O'Leary uh, asked President Clinton to go ahead and declassify all the agencies in the United States because she felt that uh, there was unethical uh, practices back then. So, four years later, after the 1990 uh, uh, RICO law was passed. Next, please. So President Clinton hired Dr. Ruth Faden, the executive director of Phoebe Berman Bioethics Institute from John Hopkins University, and they started the Human Radiation Experiments Advisory Committee. Next, please. And so these were the members. And they came from experts in bioethics, radiation oncology, biology, nuclear medicine, epidemiology, and biostatistics. And these were the members of the committee. Next, please. Matter of fact, go back, uh, Rosario, real quick. Yeah, yes. And I just want to, I forgot to read this, is the committee to investigate reports of possibly unethical experiments funded by the government decades ago. Okay, thank you, next. Next, please. Okay. Some of you can read this also. Okay, go ahead. And between April 1994 and July 1995, the advisory committee held 16 public meetings, mostly in Washington, D.C., in addition, subsets of committee members presided over public forums in cities throughout the country. The committee heard from more than 200 witnesses and interviewed dozens of professionals who were familiar with experiments involving radiation. A special uh, effort called the Ethics Oral History Project was undertaken to learn from eminent physicians about how research with human subjects were conducted in 1940s and 50s, were granted unprecedented, um, let me say, government documents. The president directed federal government to involve, uh, to make available to the committee. And, and this is very important because uh, when they published their book in 1995, I found them in 1998, and that's where I did my research from 98 to 2001. Next, please. So we know that the Radiation Exposure Compensation Act was enact, enacted in 1990. And, uh, okay, excellent. The next, so the next slide will, will go to the amendments of 2000. Next slide, please. Yeah, so the RIC of the yeah, five categories, on-site participants, downwinders, uranium ore transporters, uranium millers, and uranium miners. Next, please. And so, on July 10, 2000, this was six years later after the advisory committee, uh, Public Law 106.245, the Radiation Exposure Compensation Act Amendments in 2000, was passed. It was introduced by Senator Hatch on August 5, 1999. The amendments were one of many bills introduced in the 106 Congress in the intent to amend the existing law, which was in 1990. Most significantly, the 2000 amendments added two new claimants granted mill workers and ore transport, provided additional compensable illnesses, lowered the radiation exposure threshold for uranium miners, included ground miners within the definition of uranium miners, modified medical documentation required, and removed certain lifestyle restrictions, which were uh, smoking. And uh, next slide, please. And forgotten but not left yet, Guam gets into the picture next. So I submitted a four page report to our governor, our leaders here in Guam. And next, please. And uh, 
in 2001 because we missed the amendments in 2000. So I'm informing them that Guam and her residents were exposed to radiation. Next, please. And so they formed a blue ribbon panel, which I was a member of the blue ribbon panel. And then out of this blue ribbon panel, we came out with a 97 page report dated November 12, 2004 with Mr. Will Castro, and he's a Senator now, and Mr. Sean Briscoe. And this uh, 97 page report came from all the declassified documents that I downloaded from 98, 2001. Next, please. Next. So in September of 2002, two years after the amendments, Congress mandated the HRSA, which is the Health Research Services Administration, in accordance with Public Law 107-206, to task the National Research Council Board on Radiation Effects Research, uh, the Berkme, to conduct a study. And this study was to go out nationwide, find out what other geographical areas to include in the, uh, in the RECA program. And so I found them, uh, and, uh, and the Board of Radiation, okay. How did we get invited to present our case before the Board of Radiation uh, Effects Research? Next, please. Next. Yes. So I contacted Dr. Isaf Namusi. She was the senior study director for the Brick Committee in 2004, uh, two years after uh, they were uh, tasked to go out nationwide to find out what are the geographical areas. So we were blessed. Uh, that on February 2004, Dr. Isat Nabusi sends us an invitation to come to Washington, D.C. and present our case before the National Academies of Science. Next, please. And so this is our former Congresswoman Berdalia, myself, uh, Mr. William Brady's health business. He used to be a member of the National Academies of Science, but he retired. And so I, I called him and asked him to represent Guam, and he, he agreed. So he came with me to the National Academy of Science and uh, represented Guam, and that's our former Senator uh, Fernandez. Next, please. And so this is after the hearing, uh, I believe Montana and other states and the Navajo Nation presented their case, and I was the last one to present our case for uh, Burr Committee, and this is uh, Dr. Julian Preston, he was the chair, and Dr. Yusef, who was the senior study. Next, please. Yeah, next. So we submitted the documents, evidence of the Board of Radiation uh, Committee and scientific studies reports and INAs of radiation found in Guam and their specific testing. I also submitted sworn testimony by uh, Lieutenant Bird Schreiber that the gallery counts were up the scale during the readings in November 1952 in Guam, detecting nuclear fallout. Next, please. And so I just wanted to add this on is because the Department of Energy and Department of Defense uh, wrote a letter to our congressman back then and stated that no washdowns were done in Guam from the, the test strips that were uh, out there in the Marshall Islands and in Wittuck or Bikini Island. And I just uh, downloaded this to their Hyrex uh, website and I wanted to prove to them that they did wash down uh, certain ships here in Guam during that time period. Next, please. So this is the front page of the report after the Brewer Committee in 2004. This came out in 2005. It's called the Assessment of the Scientific Information for the Radiation Exposure Screening and Educational Program. Uh, you can uh, order the book. And next, please. So the detonation of Mike Ivey is very uh, important because on November 1st, 1952, uh, 10.4 megatons was detonated in any we talk. Next, please. And so in the book, in the report, in the 2005 report, it stated that uh, November 1st, uh, there was no radiation here in Guam, but on November 3rd, three days later, it was uh, detected that nuclear fallout was here in Guam, and it coincided with uh, Lieutenant Bert Schreiber's uh, uh, sworn testimony that uh, his Geiger counters were going off the scale. Next, please. Next, please. Yeah, so this is strontium-90 uh, deposition from 1954 uh, to 1958. And if you notice that Soak Lake City, Utah had the highest peak and Guam came in second. So that's very uh, important for our case for Guam to be included in the Radiation Exposure Compensation Act. Next, please. And here it says that I, I provided written oral testimony and that uh, uh, Lieutenant Bert Schreiber also uh, testified in the sworn test that the Geiger counts were off the scale. And also the committee initiated an independent assessment of the radiological consequences related to the weapons testing specific to people living on Guam. 
is, this is the most important conclusion. It says, as a result of its analysis, the committee concludes that Guam did receive measurable fallout from atmospheric testings of nuclear weapons in the Pacific. Residents of Guam during that period should be eligible for compensation under RECA in a way similar to that of persons considered to be downwinders. And it's very important because, see, we were this was all kept secret for many, many years. And so I'm, uh, I'm very thankful that we were given an opportunity to present this to the Burr Committee because it was not only me that was saying it now, it was a scientist uh, from the highest uh, scientific community there in Washington, D.C. Next, please. And in 2005, uh, our Congresswoman uh, presented our first bill. And right now we're waiting for two bills to be introduced, hopefully this month in the House and in the Senate. And we had a hearing in 2018, which uh, uh, Tina Cordova, Tony Anderson, myself, and President Naz of the Navajo Nation uh, presented our testimony before the, the Senate uh, Judiciary Committee in 2018. Next, please. Okay, we can skip this one. And these are just half lives examples, radio uh, active half lives from uranium all the way down to radium, a uh, number of years, 4.8 million years, and the uh, strontium 928.6. Next, please. Next, next. I, the next one will just show uh, on site participants uh, in a retail club cleanup 1977 1978. Next, please. Uh, that's me and with a hat with no shirt. That's how we dressed every day to go to work. That's the late uh, Sergeant uh, Ed Bloss, a good friend of mine. And this is Lodua Island up north, right above Runet Island. And the other gentleman down there is Mr. Suico. And I was stationed there in October of 1977 to, 19, uh, to 1978. Okay, next, please. And we're almost done. And so this is how we went to work. This is the post uh, debris that we. Uh, Dumped and run at Island, and this is a uh, mail call. Next, please. And I just wanted to show you a detonation in 1958 at Runnet Island. It was a nuclear detonation. It's called uh, Yvonne. Next, please. And this is the crater that it, it produced. This is the crater that uh, my uh, partner uh, and friend, uh, Keith Kiefer, was talking about. Next, please. Next. And this was when uh, the crater was half done. Next. And this is the completion of the run at home. And next. And I just wanted to show you our group. And this concludes our presentation. And I hope and pray that uh, we're all uh, included in the radiation exposure compensation and that also the Marshallese people maybe also uh, bring their, their issues to Congress and that they are. Uh, added on as uh, uh, for more compensation. And I want to thank our Lord Jesus Christ because without him, uh, we won't have gotten this far. And I thank you and God bless. Thanks, Rosario. Uh, thank you, Robert, for sharing about Pacific Association radiation survivors and all your ongoing hard work to keep Guam in the conversation. As island nations in the Pacific and nuclear frontline communities in general that are often silenced, I hope we can work together to make sure all our voices are being heard. Thanks Thank again. Thank you so much. God bless. And I put the two Garunilo Yellen Kajininar, Oda Kamolo Partionalen, Komodada Robert. Kamalulukan, I'm Koba Dole Chaudhary Rainin. Robert Junior and Rome are civilian and generally do anyway that. Ilo train carroyo, kada anjibyo anjibyo ramon raldo. I'm generally lo kuam. Ilo dilo presentation on. Kana naman melalo ko lo presentation ko minu kulang. Tibirigan kamelalo ko rolo ko naoro bilo an. Jine ka chito kan raldo po enjoy jam chito kan do. Ana naro ni. Paling rin makara kawegan. Cerbalga ini juga cuma cerbalik pendron. Tapi kemudian melalui korau orang tada, itu cerbalga ini an rabat embrayi lo kuam. Kau rakanan kau kuam yang berdaya lagi lo talibin corai ni kau kamera melu kau merar cerjaran cerbarjan ayam kuar embrayi lagi lo yomun bilu nathan riga aga radiation exposure conversation aga em cipar berum kata berum alip orang dalam yomun. And uh, Talibin Jorani in Mirapoxi. 
Bartonalin, Kamola Rabo, the Loda Richumor. Once again, Robert, thank you very much. Hello, everyone. Uh, I would like to welcome back Jonathan Perry to speak on behalf of his story and his experience since before we had a technical difficulty before. So I would like to apologize for that. And just to reiterate about um, jo Jonathan Perry, he is a member of the Navajo Nation and is currently serving as a Basanti chapter president and formerly served as a council delegate on a Navajo National um, I mean, Nation Council. Um, so welcome Jonathan, whenever you're ready. Oh, thank you. And uh, I hope the uh, connection is much better right now. <laughs> I do apologize as well. And uh, as I was stating earlier, you know, I am a part of the Eastern Navajo Diné against uranium mining. I had uh, joined the organization about nine years ago, uh, but the organization itself was in existence uh, since 1994, when several community members from different areas of Eastern Navajo got together and they were concerned about uh, uranium mining operations and projects that were being proposed in the uh, Eastern Navajo area. And uh, they, these were a lot of uh, grassroots individuals, uh, community members, community elders, and they uh, got organized and opposed the new projects that were coming in. And of course, the Navajo Nation itself has had a history of uranium mining, milling and processing. Uh, with our, our history with uranium mining goes back to the 1940s and you know the operations through the 1980s. But today, today we still have a lot of uh, lasting impacts that we're having to deal with. And you know, just the connection this evening uh, kind of gives a little glimpse of some of the issues that we have on Navajo Nation. Um, the, not only the telecommunication infrastructure, but roads, uh, healthcare, education, uh, these type of uh, issues are ongoing here. And uh, with the uranium uh, in issue, when I got involved uh, when I was younger, uh, there was not a lot of history or not a lot of education being given here in the community level, aside from what was going on with the uh, organizations like uh, Endom. There was nothing coming out from the uh, IHS, the Indian Health Service. There was nothing uh, being shared at the schools. The local governments were not providing you know, information to educate the community. And so the first time I got a good education on what was going on here and the lasting impacts of not only uranium but the nuclear industry came from Indom. Uh, they were doing community presentations throughout the Eastern Navajo Agency. And so that opened my eyes. That helped me to realize that the uh, issues were ongoing. And as I got to do more research and I got more uh, involved with the uranium issue, uh, I started to see, you know, how all these different connections were there regarding the nuclear industry, the uh, nuclear field chain, and realizing how how much, you know, it, it impacts a lot of people, not only the uh, local area here, but internationally, globally. Um, we have people from different walks of life who are being impacted by the nuclear industry and it, it really um, helped to identify you know for me to identify because for me being raised I was raised with Navajo values and you know we're taught Navajo fundamental law growing up you know it's it's part of our culture it's part of our ceremonies it's part of our stories our songs and you know we're taught that we do have that responsibility as a as people, not only to ourselves and our families, but to the environment, to nature, to the universe, to know where our place is and identifying our responsibility as uh, uh, beings being able to think and care and protect that we have this obligation. So in the work that I've been doing uh, on behalf of Indom and even within the tribe itself, the Navajo Nation, I, I like to carry that with me. And growing up, I feel fortunate because 
I was raised by my grandmother and she never went to, she never attended school, but she was really well uh, knowledgeable in, you know, traditional Navajo culture, Navajo law. And so she really taught me a lot growing up and uh, I had a lot of her teachings, I carried that with me. And so as I got to go around to different communities, I started to see uh, firsthand how a lot of communities were having to deal with the lasting impacts because this was now going into multiple generations. The first generation of miners that and, and millers and, and others that worked within the uranium mining industry, they were now, you know, passing passing away and their children and grandchildren were coming up and they were being exposed. And, you know, the first generation of exposures, the, the workers that worked in these mining projects, a lot of them were born at home. They weren't born in hospitals. And so there were no uh, birth certificates. There were no actual records until, you know, they enrolled in school. And so when it came time to when they when we are told you know you have to present documentation it's really hard for a lot of the older generation and we're talking about those that were born before 1965 and you know the, the folks that were born before 1965 they didn't get their birth certificates uh until they were adults some of them they are still having to wait to this day to get it and we see these type of, of issues that come up and then the records for you know going into the hospitals were not there um there were a lot of things that that came up as issues and then when a lot of these companies left they did not clean up they abandoned their properties as they were um, some companies allowed people to come in and take material say what they were building homes with radioactive material they were using stones that were coming out from the mines to build their foundations for homes their livestock were, were their animals, horses, sheep, cattle. They were grazing on areas that had been exposed to contamination. Uh, and then that even brings to mind the 1979 spill in Church Rock uh, and the lasting impacts there. And not only within the Eastern Navajo, but going down the wash into other parts of the Navajo Nation, Arizona, and parts of California. And you know, a lot of these people, a lot of folks were never uh, notified or even given proper knowledge of how much of a impact all this exposure was going to give to them. Uh, going back to a lot of the workers that uh, worked for these uranium companies, when they were in the mines, they didn't have proper uh, protection, they didn't have proper equipment, and they were even drinking water from inside the mines. Uh, they were whatever they were exposed to, they were bringing home their wives, their, their daughters, their children were washing their clothes, uh, hand washing because we didn't have laundromats, we didn't have wash machines. So a lot of the washing was done by family. And so they were being exposed to, you know, firsthand radiation. And going on to, you know, modern, modern or uh, recent times today, there's studies going on where we're still seeing uh, a, a real high rate of uh, not only uranium, but other metals in our infants that are being born. The Navajo birth cohort study that was done uh, identified how high the levels were for not only the, the infants or the newborns, but the mothers. And they're carrying this on from one generation to the next. Um, there was also the water projects that were done uh, identifying wells within the communities, uh, finding where these contaminated sites were. And today, you know, there are over 524 abandoned clustered sites. So these clustered sites we identify as two 524, but each site could be, uh, could hold additional areas. There could be as many as 15 in one clustered location. And so, you know, the Navajo Nation, not only in Eastern Navajo, but in Utah, in Arizona, uh, different locations, we're seeing how the communities are trying to uh, keep their voice being, to, to, uh, keeping their voice active in not only the tribal politics, but the state and the federal level as well. 
and a lot of our community folks are in support of RICO amendments. Our, our people have been wanting to see these amendments uh, go forward. And so there's just a lot of different uh, levels of work that's being done. And we see the lasting impacts um, that uh, continue to, to exist. And you know, a lot of our folks are tired, as as many of us are. But you know, it the the thing that drives us is that you know, it's our lives, it's the value of a person, it's knowing our self worth and the worth of other people. That each of us have value. That our parents and grandparents had value, our relatives had value, our children, our grandchildren, those that are yet to come, they have value. And so it drives us because we're not looking at profits. We're looking at lives. We're looking at the well-being of our environment and our homes. A lot of these companies, they come in and they look at, you know, these projects, getting the most out, out of it and getting as much profits as they can and getting out. But these are our homes. We, we don't go anywhere else. And we live here 24 hours a day, seven days a week, 365 days a year. And the lasting impacts to our health, you know, to the health disparities of each generation exists. And so I know with the members of NDOM, you know, we really look into that and we really consider, you know, the, the, the livelihood of our people and the coordination, the partnerships that exist because Endom is part of the Multicultural Alliance for a Safe Environment, and we we are proud to be partners with the Laguna Acoma Coalition. We're happy to be part of the uh, supportive group for the post-71 workers. We're happy to be part of the uh, Redwater Pond Association's support network. These sister organizations do a lot of different work across northern northwestern New Mexico, and we have a lot of folks that are very uh, active in different parts of the nuclear uh, fuel chain. And with NDOM, we, we try to do our best to remain active and supportive to everyone's work. And so, you know, and being invited here this evening to have these discussions and uh, engage with the panelists and in the listeners, it's really, it motivates each and every one of us because I think it reminds all of us that we're not alone in this that we do have each other and we do have the understanding of the different experiences that we bring, the knowledge that we all have, the love that exists between ourselves and our families and our communities and our people. And I think that's really going to drive us forward. And, you know, these companies, these corporations, they're driven by money, but we're driven by life and love. And I think that's going to make us help us to get a lot further than they ever could dream of. And we are, we have that responsibility for future generations. For me, that that's what drives me. And I know talking with a lot of community members and our Indom members, that that's our foundation in the work that we do. And we're gonna keep our position and we're gonna keep doing what we can on our side. And we just want to encourage everyone out there to continue your efforts to continue to be involved, to find your place in this, this fight that we have for ourselves, because we all have a place. We all have a talent and a skill that we can provide, no matter what it is, we all have something to give to help each other out. So let, let's continue to move forward. But Endom, we're, we're gonna keep moving as well as an organization and on behalf of the Navajo people. And I'm just very grateful for the, the sharing of knowledge that I was given over the years by a lot of the people who have been active firsthand, the people that have been in this fight for so long, for many, many years. So, you know, let, let's, um, our Indom, our philosophy is to, to provide a safe and uh, livable future for future generations. But the Navajo Nation, we continue to stand on our priorities to not only clean up the uh, local, uh, the current contaminated sites, and, but also to prohibit new mining because the Navajo Nation does have a ban on 
uh, uranium mining and processing and even transportation of radioactive material. And uh, what we're trying to do is look at covering these loopholes where companies still can get on the, the uh, state highways, the interstates and transport. You know, how can we look at tribal sovereignty? What, what does it look like at a tribal approach? How can we coordinate with the uh, tribal, with the different tribes, not only Navajo Nation, but other indigenous peoples across this continent, across the world in protecting their homes? So yeah, there's a lot of work that NDOM is engaged in and it's just so motivating to hear everybody else, but also our hearts go out to everyone because of the firsthand experiences they're having the pain that they have endured, but yet they're strong enough to continue to go forward. So, you know, NDOM, we're here as a supportive organization and we're going to uh, maintain our opposition. And we've been trying to, with our limited uh, membership, we've been trying to uh, support other organizations in prohibiting uh, nuclear energy and nuclear weapons. We've been working on being allies to others and supportive to others in, uh, you know, saying that nuclear energy is not green energy in no way, shape or form. And the, the statement that Navajos have is that life is precious, life is holy, and nuclear weapons, nuclear weapon development is not Navajo. We should not be supporting any initiatives that involve that aspect as well. So we've been educating our people and uh, reaching out to our community members to, you know, have them look at the entire picture, because we do have that, uh, we do have that understanding of the uranium industry. But now we're trying to uh, let everyone know how that connects to the nuclear industry and how the federal government throughout the the past, how we have been exposed and uh, neglected in terms of what we what we have in, endured because we had to endure the federal Indian policy. Now we're having to deal with the energy development, the BIA, the, uh, the, the boarding schools and all this ties in and even the aspects of our limited coverage with the Indian Health Service um, with the lack of resources being provided to the communities here um, we don't have the treatments that we need for our people here on the Navajo Nation. They have to travel out and, you know, it, it's, it's a lot because that Navajo Nation, we're, we're trying to continue to adjust to the modern uh, Western society that we have, yet, you know, the, the amount of exposure with the energy development that's taking place and even you know, with, with our neighbors, it's not just indigenous people, but low income communities, communities that um, in, in rural areas, whether, you know, what whatever walk of life they are, they're exposed as well. So we tried to to remain open and, and understanding to everyone. And, you know, this, this contamination, the nuclear exposure goes across all lines. As we say, you know, the contamination does not respect jurisdiction. Contamination does not stop at, at any type of borders. It, it goes beyond. And so we all have to partner together. So those are some of the points that, you know, NDOM we make and myself, and we just um, are gonna continue on with our efforts. But I wanna thank everyone for giving us this amount of time uh, this evening to share our stories and to share what we can do. So I, I wanna thank everyone. Yeah. Thank you, Jonathan, for sharing and for um, embracing the Navajo communities and like the valuable traits that they carry within the tribe. Jonathan, but you're Navajo Nation tribes. I am for Kalo Pavanado Wayne and Kobay Kajuji Pendron, but you're Jonathan, Jim Magayar.
Uh, next, we have Victoria Moore and Kathy Sinai, who are the founders of the organization Children of Atomic Veterans. Children of Atomic Veterans is a non-research organization working to help bridge the global gap to provide easier access to relevant information. In doing so, helping to provide for different communities and their families. Um, I invite you both to go ahead. Hi, my name is Kathy Sinai, and history has always been a part of my family. It's always been very important, and I'm the keeper of the, the history of my family. And if we don't share our stories and our information, who's who will? Watching the history and the traditions of the Marshallese pass from the elders to the younger generations was really exciting for me. Um, I cried when I saw the teens dancing because without them and their interest for the traditions, the traditions fade away. And you must all be so proud of your youth and their involvement in these programs because without them, they don't continue. My father was just 18 when he went to the Mar uh, Marshall Islands for Operation Hardtack in 1958. And he had never seen such a thing. He was not expecting what he saw. He suffered the after effect. Alexa, turn on Easterly. He saw, he lost half a lung and suffered prostate cancer. But compared to a lot of men, he, he fared fairly well. My brother and I both suffer from after effects. Um, I was born with a congenital birth defect. I had no cartilage in either of my ankles. It wasn't diagnosed until I was 28. And as a hairdresser for 30 years, it was quite painful. I have four inch pins in both of my ankles holding my feet together. Um, I have thyroid tumors, parathyroid tumors. And in 2019, I was diagnosed with a brain tumor. Um, I have a huge passion for research. And after looking into my father's service and these, the domino effect um, genetics um, and the need to help people. As I was studying genetics and reading stories on Facebook, I was drawn to different people and Victoria was one of them. And during the Obama administration, he would read emails that you'd send. So I started an email campaign and just picked random people and wrote emails every day to the Obama administration. And one day I got a phone call and they said to call him back and I completely freaked out. And I called Keith Kiefer and I said, have you ever heard of this place? And he said, uh, no. And I said, oh my goodness. And he, so we Googled it and it turned out it was real. And I call, and I had to introduce myself to Victoria, a woman I had never met and tell her the White House sent me a private line and was told by President Obama that they were directed to help her, the Washington DC VA. So after overcoming that I wasn't a lunatic from Facebook, I gave her the information and we began a friendship. And through the next couple of years, we passed on Facebook doing different things. I got some genetic tests uh, put together I put together a media presentation. Um, I got together a couple of veterans. I'm, I really enjoy getting, raising up different exposure groups. Uh, Fort McClellan has nuclear waste on their base. Uh, Clean Up Veterans have my heart. Nucle Atomic Veterans, obviously because of my dad. And, I, and those are the ones that I've had most exposure for. And then the Marshallese. Um, I've done email campaigns on behalf of the Marshallese. So I did a television media story. I put it all together. I called my local thing, uh, um, television station, and they put it up. I was really happy. And that was in 2017 and it, it aired in San Francisco and Sacramento. Um, I have a motto that it never hurts to ask. And so I just ask. I asked for genetic tests and they gave them to me. They were 
priced at $1,000 each. And they said, sure, you can have 350 of them, no problem. But I didn't have the trust of the community yet. And so only six people showed up to use them. But I did gain valuable knowledge from these scientists. They trained me, they educated me, and they were really great guys. Um, children of Atomic Veterans Now, our platform is, is science and moving our ionizing radiation community forward. And we have a goal with childrenofatomicveterans.org, our foundation, to promote and support nuclear weapons exposure-based projects focused on science, genetics, and moving our community forward. The Tooth Fairy Study Project Part 2, uh, Gender and Radiation Research, uh, an ionizing radiation-specific genetic test kit, and a medical document for our medical files specifically to give our doctors a heads up of what our community goes through that they're not aware of. And these, these are the projects that we have on deck and we're excited to partner with other people in 2022. Um, when, I, when I was doing my research, and I saw that the Marshallese were simply being studied by Lawrence Livermore Lab, and they were actively recruiting people to come and study the island, but they were getting no tangible health care. I was so angry. I was so angry, and it was years of it. They had what looked like a medical facility on the island, but it did nothing for the people. It, all it did was study. And so I started emailing them, asking them why they didn't do this and why they didn't do that. And I just never got any answers. And so hopefully with childrenofatomicveterans.org, we can get some programs and some projects together and we can move everybody forward. And I, I'm really happy to be here. Thank you for having us. And my friend Victoria is now going to make a beautiful presentation for the Marshallese people. Hi, um, my name is Victoria Moore. I'm not going to be able to get through this without emotion. It's like meeting family for the first time. Um, it's an honor to be here and tell our family story. I'm an artist. The piece behind me is an honor to all of you today. Uh, the cleanup veterans have my heart. That is your dome. That is the lacrosse scar on the face of the earth behind you. And just one of the many blasts that have blown holes in the atmosphere and our lives and uh, the contamination just continues to rain down. I was gonna save telling about the painting till the end, but hopefully it'll get me past the emotional part and you can enjoy it as I tell my story. I put Lady Justice to have her weapon down. The title of this painting is called Unintended Consequences. But I felt important she didn't hold the weapon in her hands since this is about anti-weapon. The scales are tipped slightly, but there's nothing in them because what is our challenge is invisible and it makes it hard to talk about. She, I wanted her in a position of almost saluting in honor of those who did this work with the best of intentions, including the Marshallese thinking it was the right thing to do. But we can't be blind to it anymore. So Lady Justice is looking and peeking behind the blindfold. Um, it is my statement. The original will go to auction. We're talking to international auction houses now, and I'm doing that as a way to raise awareness in audiences and places we don't see it. Um, I think the artists of today should be compelled to raise their voice or raise their art or raise their performances. And again, with Kathy, it was a pleasure to see your young people taking this on. My family's connection to the Marshall Islands um, go, my father was not a young man, as many of these men were when he first came down there. Um, but he arrived for the first time at Majuro on the USS Melvin in 1943. He fought 
the occupiers to get those islands back. And then he went to Oak Ridge in 49 as uh, somehow in leading the naval communications, radio, crypto, when it was building the USS Estes known as the Elegant Lady and the listening and communication devices they refer to as her elephant ears. He stayed with that ship through his entire career. He was at every blast she attended in the Pacific Proving Grounds. He was proud of the work. Um, when I was 12 years old, the military medical showed me this certificate, pulled it out of a classified envelope on the ninth, seventh or ninth floor of Oak Knoll Naval Hospital and informed me I was an atomic child. I had just moved into a need to know position at 12 when I was able to officially reproduce. And I was told at that meeting that I would fall under my father's uh, Q clearance, which was a 50 year clearance and all the threats that came along with it. It's the very strangest birds and beasts story ever. And the pictures I was shown of stillbirths and uh, other things I'll choose not to describe here. Um, many were probably uh, from the mothers on the Marshall Islands. So, but unlike the chief, I've served without any recognition. I was forced out of the military medical at 21 when you age out, but into a civilian medical environment, unable to talk about it. And by 15 years old, um, we were informed and uh, men listen up because if you think the reproduction issues are just women, um, at 15, we started preparing uh, for penal cancers. And um, by 19, uh, all chemo and treatment therapies had been a failure. And uh, we went through a penalectomy with his testicles removed. Uh, and to carry on the reproductive issues and the genetic challenges while they put me, military put me on birth control pills at age 12, they began controlling my body. Um, by 19, I started having reproductive organ failure and by 23, a full hysterectomy. So my father and I had this bond that no one else in the family had. Uh, we couldn't talk about it, but he was getting the best military medical care available and the decision was not to ever step out of the system. So we became guinea pigs documented in the human radiologic experiments of the day. But his base, when uh, he went into uh, active retirement with his ship was Treasure Island. And that was Atomic Central in that time period. And um, Hunter's Point, Treasure Island, Oak Knoll, all the places that he and I ventured everywhere we went are now super fun cleanup sites. Um, it was amazing that these extensive exposures down there, I mean, they were some of the worst tests ever. And uh, they told me I would have a very complicated future that my cancers would track like his. That is true. Um, we're into third or fourth now. And uh, I feel honored to still be able to be here and fight about it. Um, as a child, I would wander the halls of, of Oak Knoll Naval Hospital um, and wonder if there were other children were like me. I assumed there were lots of us, um, but by the, what I'm hearing now and experiencing is it's a pretty rare story. So there's more of that up on the website. Um, the, uh, how it's impacted the family overall. My brother was 11 years older. He was never exposed, but due to the military Q clearance, he was not living in the house at the time when I was told he was married with a new family. There became a decision not to tell him both the chief's, my father, the chief's decision or uh, the military advised against it. So for 40 years, my brother never knew the truth of his father. And uh, that only came up because of Rika. They rushed us through there and made it a very quick pass to the, the documentation I had on him was amazing. His life was amazing. It has forever bonded me to the islands. 
And this is just the latest in the atomic series. There are more coming. Um, I would like to thank everybody. I hope to come back and share more stories with you. The first artist proof one will be working with David to get it down to the Marshall Islands, my gift and the children of atomic gifts to you. Uh, thank you, Kathy and Victoria for sharing your stories and also working alongside us joining in on the planning meetings. It's nice that we all got to meet prior to this week. Uh, And Kamulul, uh, Victoria, I'm Kathy Parjun Allen, and um, presentation of Manamanewer. Um, Parjun special Kamulul and Victoria and Terbal Gayan from Mani Richen. I Pijaga in me, which Pijaga and Kachum Poto Pipinato in me, Rakabulan, um, Rundukun Alap, um, a Chapiru, Kamulu Lady, another Pijayan with Kaloway, Komoda Dagan, um, Kanan Lego Pijayan and uh, Roilo. I just again expressed gratitude and extent of uh, appreciation to Kathy, especially Victoria, for your hard work for presenting this to again uh, the Marshallese uh, communities. Thank you. So unfortunately, we are running out of time and out of respect for everyone's time. We aren't able to continue to a Q and A, but I want to. We want to thank you all for sharing and taking your time to be a part of this event. This is the first time to gather various communities for Marshall Islands March Nuclear Victims Remembrance. So thank you for being a part of this. We are more than just our nuclear history and we are more together. In solidarity, sharing stories shows the strength and resilience of nuclear frontline communities. And I'll give it to Jackie to introduce the poem. All right, so the poem I will be introducing is for dedicated to Jan Lendrick, was a Marshallese poet and educator. He was highly gifted with words and knowledge of the Marshall Islands. He passed away recently at the age of 71 and throughout his life, he was a teacher, school principal, education, secretary, public service commission chairman, and most recently a member of the RMI customary law and language commission. We'll be honoring him and his family with this video of a song based on his poem, We Are Marshallese from his family. เจียงมันนี่เจียงอาเลโอเมอีกตัวเป็นเจียงอีกอาโกมวานโกมวานเนี่ยอาเจียงชวนย้ายไปดูเจียงเลยไม่ใจตัวเล่นเข้มรู้
Uh, thank you to Jan Longiduk's family for sharing with their beautiful voices to wrap up uh, the, today's program. We want to once again thank all the speakers who continue to share their stories and advocate for peace, justice, and our future. Thank you to the Marshallese Spokane community, planning committee, and partners who worked hard to support and get it, everything together. We also want to thank the viewers who are joining in or will join in for listening to these powerful stories that we should never forget. Tonight and this whole week shows that regardless of our distance and current pandemic, we are able to come together and up uplift. We truly are not alone. We are signing off as your MCs and want to hand it over to David with announcements. Wow, uh, again, extension of uh, the Komol Dada to, to all of our uh, panels today and all the great information that was shared. Uh, uh, big Komol Dada to the MCs, uh, Malaika and uh, Jackie, great job. And to all of our team behind the scenes, I wanna let you all know that we have, um, you know, it takes a collective effort from all of our uh, members, individuals that are involved and uh, certainly not gonna, um, share all the different names, but you know who you are. We appreciate you. Um, please continue to follow this event. Uh, as you've heard tonight, just powerful, powerful uh, stories and uh, the reason to stay together and stand up together um, and truly present that we're not alone. Komol uh, Dada again to uh, all the powerful stories and especially special Komol Dada once again to uh, uh, the family from uh, Ten Mangere Komoldada family. Uh, for tomorrow, uh, we have yet again another exciting event. Um, please tune in at five o'clock. We'll we'll start uh, live and then we'll uh, with with the music and our presenters tomorrow. Um, all the way from the Marshall Island, um, the journalist and editor of the Marshall Island Journal, Gabe Johnson, and uh, Arkansas Council General uh, for the Marshall Islands, Eldon Alec. Uh, Kelly Pigini Edget, uh, officer member in Arkansas office for the Kelly Pigini Edget families and community, uh, Soslina Chibas Madison, a descendant of um, Anuadak survivor, Bu Irene Jidiam, and who is also a cancer survivor, Lucille Brocken, and our RMI National Nuclear Commission um, educator, uh, organizer in the Marshall Islands, Ariana Tiban, and a powerful, powerful story, um, just a filmmaker who put all of this together, uh, working on this 2023 uh, Grassroot, uh, Brian Cowden, um, featuring, I mean, presenting the voices of our world on fire. Brian Cowden, region. Chimatan Jenny Barchinoy from 5:30 tomorrow to 7:30 p.m. tomorrow. Once again, please join us live from um, Spokane. Kumaldada to our presenters and to everyone again behind the scenes helping this, making this possible. Kumaldada. Take care and have a good night.
Yeah.